Opening Merchant Interface Scanning Trade Routes Scanning for cargo destinations within jump range Cargo shipment available 13 tons of classic traveler rulebooks and 27 tons of traveler 5 rulebooks Destined for the Imperial Palace in the Capital System Contacting Mark Miller of Far Future Enterprises Stand by Greetings travelers and welcome to the Milestone Traveler Mayday Mayday 2023 Proudly sponsored by Cyborg Prime Games. You can find me at cyborgprime.com, on Facebook by searching for my name, or through the link in the video description below. We're thrilled to have you join us for the fifth annual Mayday Mayday Traveler Day event, a day dedicated to celebrating Traveler, its various editions and offshoots, and all the fantastic memories it's created around the gaming table with friends and family. I'm your host, Frank Zuccardi, also known as Cyborg Prime, and today it's an absolute honor to introduce our esteemed keynote guest speaker, none other than Mark Miller, one of the brilliant creators of Traveler RPG and the mastermind behind Traveler 5, 5th edition. Uh, welcome back, Mark. Thank you, Frank, for having me. Mark, tell us, how did, how did you come up with the concept of Traveler, and uh, what were your main inspirations for the game? I call myself a classic, classically trained science fiction reader. I spent my entire youth reading science fiction. I have to say I consumed every issue of analog or astounding science fiction. I weekly bought the paperbacks or went to the library. And I'm saying I'm, I started when I was 10. I have read science fiction enthusiastically all of my life. And uh, once upon a time, boy, it's a long story, but we'll try and cut it short. Okay. GDW, GDW Game Designers Workshop was the game company that I uh, established with Frank Chadwick and Rich Banner and Lauren Wiseman back in 1973. And our focus was not science fiction, it was war games. Hex maps with die cut counters and uh, volumes of rules about World War II or obscure uh, South American wars or naval warfare or whatever. But I always kind of wanted to do science fiction, and I was a strong advocate for GW doing that. And so we kind of ventured into science fiction board games. And by that, I mean uh, a game about asteroid mining and uh, a game about space battles in a, in a double star system. Interesting games, I thought. In parallel with that, we had a lot of fans who loved our work and enjoyed our work, and we enjoyed some success. And at one point, some war gamers from Detroit came to our offices in central Illinois to talk to us because they were fans and we love to have them. And it's great talking about things like this. They showed us Dungeons and Dragons, which we'd never heard of, and uh, enthusiastically told us how much fun they were having playing with that. Literally, you, know, you have to remember that our staff of six or seven people were dedicated game designers. We knew how to play games. We we made our living understanding how games worked and making games for publication. And when we saw this little box set of Dungeons and Dragons, it took about half an hour for us to fully understand its import and how it played, what it did and what it did and how much fun it was. Now, the story I tell is that it just about ruined our company because everybody started playing, creating their Dungeons and Dragons campaigns and playing with each other on Dungeons and Dragons. And after about a week, Frank Chadwick, who was the president and boss of GDW, said uh, he, he would just come up with pronouncements. I remember that we didn't have a board meeting we, we, where we discussed it. He just said, you can't play Dungeons and Dragons while the sun's up. We were getting no work done. We had games that were on the schedule that were being created or tested or written or typeset or whatever, and no work was being done. So we all just said, yes, sir, no games, no playing Dungeons and Dragons while the sun's up. So we waited till the sun went down and the offices were filled with us playing in the evening, but at least we started getting some work done during the day. <laughs> um, that had to be very early in the process of, of Dungeons and Dragons taking over the world. Um, but very soon I said, well, first of all, I had a game typical for GDW, a game, a hex map um, of the stars near Earth and a uh, slower than light transport system 
colonizing other worlds. It was a, a great economic game. It was a, a very tedious game. We called it Imperium. I've used, I recycled the name for another game. Mm -hmm. so we called it Imperium and, and everybody enjoyed it because that's the sort of game we enjoyed playing. Um, but uh, I don't think we ever really seriously considered publishing it. It was way too tedious and deep and complex and everything. But seeing Dungeons and Dragons after several months, I said, you know, we should do Dungeons and Dragons in space. And everybody said, sure, go ahead and do that. That's how we did things at Game Designers Workshop. The designer was actually in charge of everything and just conceptualized it and did whatever work he wanted to do until it got to final form. I see. So I said, sure, I'm going to do that. So whoever whoever brought it up got to uh, just volunteered to do it. <laughs> right. Yep. Yep. I mean, uh, the statistic I give is that Game Designers Workshop, in its 22 years of existence, created one new product, a uh, game, a magazine issue, something, every 22 days for 22 years. That was a very, just a, a endless treadmill of getting things done. So in a very productive period of, uh, in 1976, I worked on creating Traveler. Didn't have a title for it at the beginning, but um, but we wanted to do something different than Spaceman or Star Citizen or Space Marine or Star Fleets or whatever. Mm -hmm. And uh, we really kind of we were strongly influenced by a variety of of science fiction that was out at the time, including Doomrests, Doomrest of Terra, um, Paul Anderson's. Um, Palazzo Technic League with traders and, you know, um, Andre Norton's uh, Solar Queen, all kinds of science fiction that mm -hmm. any reasonable science fiction reader would have been reading at the time. So we settled on, I settled on Traveler, and then we had to have a, a had to make it sound different. So I put the double L, the British double L, and to, mm -hmm. to distinguish it. You well, deceived me. <laughs> I thought you were British for the longest time, oh <laughs> based God. on that. And uh, <laughs> yeah, we announced the title in um, early '77 in anticipation of going to um, Origins Game Show in Staten Island mm -hmm. uh, in the summer. And uh, SPI, we we put it out without really explaining what the title meant or what it was about. Richard Berg at uh, SPI thought it was a uh, a civil war an American Civil War game because Traveler was Robert E. Lee's horse. <laughs> oh. <laughs> so quite a surprise for them. We worked and worked and worked. I, I showed this system to um, our, my fellow designers and they would test it. I would come up with some process and show it to them and they would look at it and enjoy it. And when they had a good time, then it worked. And if it didn't work or they weren't having a good time, we tried other, some other system. Traveler was went live in July of uh, 1977. It's interesting that I spent that year, most of 76 and much of 77, writing not only Traveler, but Imperium, the board game of uh, Interstellar War, and uh, a couple other games just were on my plate as well. So hmm. it shows how hard we worked and how much we worked all the time. That sounds like you guys were pretty prolific with your games and a very busy shop. It was very busy, and we just worked. We ate, lived, slept, breathed games. Mm -hmm. Well, so what made you what made you decide on the format of the of the you know eight and a half by eleven kind of folded in half in, into a booklet? Oh, it, I was TSR had established the format for role playing games: three books in a box. I see a small box, not an eight and a half by eleven box. Mm -hmm. They had established that format. And, and that format, of course, sprung from other books like Chainmail and Tactics and everything else that TSR was putting out. But we were not trying to pioneer a new format. We were trying to literally do Dungeons and Dragons in space. And, and I say that facetiously because I wanted this to be science. I wanted this to be serious science fiction, not science fantasy. I, I kind of, Traveler kind of shades into space opera but it's epic space opera that people enjoy playing. So, 
Do you have any uh, favorite adventure campaign that you've written or played in? Oh, my goodness. Of course, everybody who plays Traveler has been playing in my campaign. I, <laughs> I guess so. <laughs> yeah, you know, I wanted, when I started, when this started, I wanted to reproduce the science fiction that I had read. Mm -hmm. And I had read a lot of science fiction. And I soon found that I couldn't duplicate it all. First of all, if, if you actually read with a discerning eye, you find that the, the the science fiction writers rarely told us how their spaceships worked in any detail. Right. And they rarely told us how long it took to get somewhere. Did it take a day? Did it take a week, a month, a couple minutes? Right. Um, they, they didn't tell us. They didn't tell us how much fuel it took. How much does it cost to go there? And of course, that's true. Nobody tells us how much it costs to fuel a a, a U.S. Navy destroyer to drive to to sail from San Francisco to Japan. They don't tell us how many times they refueled. They don't tell us anything like that. But as players, we soon find we want to know that information. We don't want to run out of fuel. We want to know what we're doing, how we're doing it, what process can I refuel. I found that as I had to answer each of those questions, as the players, my testers asked them, we came up with processes like, how much fuel it takes to travel so from one place to another. I see. Fuel cheap is fuel expensive. All of those details came, kind of jumped out of the woodwork. Frankly, there were dozens of ways I could answer them. It helps to just have one way, and that's what Traveler did. You know, I'll make the point that Traveler was not intended to be obscure or difficult to play. It was not intended to be... Uh, expensive for a player to play. We wanted it to be something that our players could afford to go to another world and do something. Mm -hmm. They could afford to own a spaceship, maybe not easily, but they it's within their the realm of their possibility. You know, Captain Kirk does not own the Star the Enterprise. Right. He just is allowed to use it. In Star Wars, uh, you own your Han ship. Solo owns mm -hmm. the right. ship. Right. There are big ships that people don't own, but there are ships that people can own. Traveler was intended to be, is intended to be a game where you can do the things that you want to do. And there are some challenges involved in it, but you can do them. Um, it also was supposed to be, is supposed to be understandable. You know, Star Trek is understandable to a player that he understands there's a federation and he understands how the enterprise works. Similarly with Star Wars, we understand that process in there. I wanted Traveler to be intuitive to the player, that he pretty much, if you're a trader, you know you're buying stuff cheap and selling it expensive. Mm -hmm. uh, if you're in the military, you're going somewhere and you're fighting. If you're uh, a scout, you're going somewhere and exploring. And I needed to give the tools to the players. But once they understand what their character is supposed to be doing or what they want their character to do, they can do it, and it pretty how much did makes you, sense. How did you come up with, like, how to scale that? Did you think of, like, you know, it should cost as much as going on a road trip, but, like, bigger, or, like, uh, it should it should be, like, driving a semi, or, like, you know, um, how did you come up with, you know, how much a person would make in a, you know, your, your, your salaries versus how much a ship costs and that kind of um, economy? Uh, well, it was trial and error. I mean, we... <laughs> It, it was trial and error. I came up with numbers and, oh, this is too cheap. Everybody gets a ship. So that doesn't work. Let's bump this number up. You know, I picked credits. That's a great science fiction unit of exchange. Mm -hmm. And it was about, a you know, about a dollar. The uh, credit's about a dollar. So uh, uh, one credit will buy you a snack or something. And mm -hmm. credits will buy you something more. And I, I didn't want to get into hyperinflation. A million credits is a lot of money. A person can easily handle a couple hundred credits or a couple thousand, but doesn't easily have access to hundreds of thousands. Um, sure. But it, you know, just like Monty Hall, sometimes you have a, an ex expedition that gets you a lot of money. Right. Or you can pull your resources with other players and, and buy yourself a ship. That's, uh, you know, one of the things about, about role playing when it was all shiny and new back in the uh, 70s with early Dungeons and Dragons and with the other role playing games that showed up. 
is that there was no analysis of what it was. We were all playing it by the seat of our pants. Right. And it's only over time that we have distilled the some of the important parts of role playing, like nobody has enough power by themselves to go exploring or to make things work. You need friends. And uh, one guy's the pilot, one guy's the gunner, one guy's the engineer. Uh, you kind of have that like kind of Star Trek ensemble, if you will, you know? That's right. That, that mm -hmm. everybody complements and supplements each other. Mm -hmm. And it's more fun playing with a bunch of people than it is trying to do it alone. What's your What are your thoughts on the current state of the tabletop industry? Um, where do you see it going in the future? And what do you think of like uh, virtual tabletops and things like that? Every part of role playing has its attraction. That I have played um, um, console games, uh, the computer games, the virtual tabletops. The greatest challenge we have is getting a three or four other people to sit down with us at a set time every week to play. And I think virtual tabletop goes a long way to removing the geographical separations that we have. At the same time, there's nothing like sitting around and playing in the at the dining room, at the dining table, uh, being right there with your people and uh, seeing their faces and understanding their thoughts and and doing that. You know, that's we have the rise of, of the rise of the continuation of, of conventions. That there are people who go to conventions and they, I go to conventions. I'm sorry that the pandemic had stopped my attendance. That people like playing at a table with somebody else. You know, our, our, our hobby is blessed because there are people who want to play and there are people who want to game master. And that, that I'm, I'm always impressed with the preparation that game masters do, planning to come to a convention and set up a game and play it with people. And they have a wonderful time, but that preparation from the game master is, is just a labor of love yeah i i agree i like uh if it wasn't for vtt i there would be some games that i wouldn't have ever done and people i never would have met so um yay yeah, for right. vtt yeah. <laughs> we have uh in my traveler game uh, i have two two players from canada a player from australia uh and uh, another player from here in santa fe so uh it's a way to bring people from all over the world with the you know love of uh and passion for traveler so I yeah, personally love it. Let's talk about player agency uh, and player choice and traveler. Um, your your life events kind of toss and turn you through uh, through your life uh, in traveler. Um, as you go along, I mean, you you apply for a job, you don't get it. Um, you ha you end up in a different path, but but then there's also you know um, house rules and things like that that people play with. But how do you balance player agency and player choice um, with your own vision of the game story and setting? Uh, life is, a, well, life it, life would be very comfortable if every choice you made was the right choice and uh, every uh, endeavor you did uh, had wonderful rewards. Before I got into gaming, I was, after I got out of college, I joined the Army. I expected to spend a career in the Army. I had been in ROTC in college. I graduated with a, 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 um, a commission. Mm -hmm. and off I went. I dedicated my life at that point. That was what I was going to do. I spent a year in Vietnam. I came back, and uh, the Army had decided that it didn't need 600,000 men anymore, and I was one of those that they selected to not continue in the Army. And that's one of the choices in Traveler Character Generation. You, know, mm -hmm. you join, and they decide you're not going to stay. Outside forces control your fate just as much as your own choices. Right. Um, I thought it was important to not give people a career path that they could just decide they were going to do something and then they do it and there they are. Um, they still can they, through luck of the dice. They, they yeah. can, but, but mm -hmm. you know, the, the dice make decisions that we wouldn't make. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, and, you know, there's the other thing that, that there's a discussion I'm following on Twitter right now about Systems that let play, that make players die, mm. and uh, you shouldn't do that. That's player player death is is traumatic or triggering. I don't mean to 
minimize that. I don't mean to 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 gloss over that. I think it, player death is, is a difficult process. Mm -hmm. you know, when I write when I write fiction, I have trouble killing people. <laughs> <laughs> you have to kill your darlings, they say. <laughs> yeah. um, and, and and so, but at the same time, if we didn't have this initial in the initial character generation player death everybody would be an admiral with a lot of money and a ship right um, no well player death yeah. during character generation is one of the enduring things of traveler i mean it's well known for that yeah, but at least I, you I, die yeah. up front instead of after you've <laughs> fallen in love with your character right it's, <laughs> it's part of the brand um, <laughs> and and you know we all we all are aware even in our lives that we some things we don't do because you can die in real life, you know, and, and some people we know that one kid in high school who always liked to drive his car fast and he ended up crashing and he's dead and he didn't get past high school. There right. are choices that we make and, and death is one of those consequences of making bad decisions. And we've carried it over into Traveler that, you know, gunfights are deadly. The best choice is not to get in a gunfight, find some other option. People want to have combat. Dungeons and Dragons has combat. Traveler has combat. Mm -hmm. Smart people don't get in combat. They find some other answer to what they're doing. Sure. Um, yeah, I like uh, I like that. You know, the 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 death feature. Um, I mean, because like look at that tv show deadliest catch those guys are just catching lobsters which are just like they go into the traps they don't have to fight the lobster or anything right but you know you do have to worry about getting tangled up in wires and ropes and blown overboard and you know you just went out for a you know to catch some some lobsters and now you're dead <laughs> so uh yeah it happens and i think that simulation carried over into traveler paid off thank you in a lot thank of ways you. yeah yeah it's cool uh, let's talk about Traveler's reputation for being a more realistic science uh, sci-fi game. You mentioned earlier you wanted to make a, a science fiction, not necessarily science fantasy. So um, how did you... Um, let's talk about your approach to creating a plausible future setting and also, like, where does psionics fit into that? Because, um, you know, uh, a lot of... There's controversy about psionics being woo woo magic or whatever, and uh, how does that fit in with the with the plausible, realistic aspects of the game, um, or how was it intended anyway? All, yeah, well, first of all, I wanted the science fiction. I wanted the traveler to be realistic, um, which is why I went with a skill system and a levelless system. We don't just get better when we do things or get stronger. That's uh, in fact. One of the things I put in, I wrote Traveler when I was 30, and I looked at these characters and I said, you know, they're going to get old and they're going to get less able, not more able after a point, you know, mm -hmm. you get better and then you get worse. I had a conversation with um, somebody who has done the high jump every year since he was 12. He's 80 now. And he's like says, Jack Lane. <laughs> yeah, and, and so and he he's an enthusiast. He was a coach. He he's an enthusiastic physical education person. And he said, when you start out every year as you compete, you try and get better. And then there is a point where you, you don't get better, and you try to get less worse every year. And there's this 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 uh, bell curve of achievement versus age and i looked i i looked at that concept for aging so i made a rule that didn't say you just automatically get worse when you're at this age and that age but you there's a chance the dice impel something you mm -hmm. can struggle mightily and maybe not get worse but uh if you've played traveler and encountered the aging system mm -hmm. one of the points i make is that now here it is i've gone through that aging system I should be very pleased. It was a very real, realistic aging. <laughs> yeah, uh, no, it's good. Um, I, I do like it. And um, I like how, you know, like you say, uh, there's you're not guaranteed injuries or whatever, but, you know, it happens. And um, 
but you know one of the other cool things is when you're rolling up your character and you have personal development so you can kind of like beef up your stats in anticipation of get growing old yep. if yep. if that's your plan you know with your character even though that may not play out but <laughs> and, and, and isn't it interesting that that personal development is not all that great it's plus one point uh-huh yeah uh, you know, i must have spent that year weight lifting weights and my my strength is a <laughs> An eight instead of a seven. Mm -hmm. Oh, you know, which some of that kind of reveals my own attitude towards physical education, <laughs> how, how beneficial it is to spend your life going to the gym every day. <laughs> <laughs> my players uh, wanted to uh, increase the gravity level on their ship so that over time they would grow stronger. Oh, that, that's, that's sure. I give them that bonus for that. Yeah, I was like, okay, you've been doing that for you know six months now, and I have really beefy legs. <laughs> so yeah, so how so how did you kind of how how would you mesh then? Uh, you know, like your the the realism of the of the game compared to some of the other games, like um, you know, you got. Well, let me think like Shadowrun's another sci-fi but that's kind of, you know that's fantasy and cyberpunk um how do you and then you know with with star wars and 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 star trek they already have like established lore so like how, how do you come up with that and how do you make sure that your game is, has a more realistic feel i mean aside from the aging thing i mean just the overall thing has a more realistic feel to it but you know if you we're really talking about the three little black books from a long time ago. You know, mm -hmm. I think the lore has, has built over time. Oh, that's but true. The concept in the, in those three little black books was to give enough background that, that players could understand what they wanted to do and, and, and work. The game master could pretty much flesh it out. It was a generic interstellar empire. I was influenced by classic science fiction. Mm-hmm. You know, recently Amazon did um, Foundation. Right. Isaac Asimov's Foundation. I haven't seen you know, it. I hope it's good. You know, it's based on Traveler. They wrote that in 1947. Traveler was written in 1977. <laughs> One of those influenced the other, I'm sure. You know, <laughs> the idea of, of Foundation, a galactic empire, makes a lot of sense. The original Traveler was all humans, mm -hmm. you may remember. Everything was easy for somebody to pick that game up, generate characters, and at the end of the first session, somebody has a merchant character, somebody has a scout, somebody has a soldier, somebody has just some Han Solo rogue type guy. Mm -hmm. There you are. And right. then you go off and do something. And then the game master, there were very little ideas on what to play. The idea was that the game master would come up with something. You know, an, an early review of Traveler, the reviewer said, there aren't any adventures. We need adventures. I don't want to play a game. I, I want the publisher to give me a structure to play in. And the editor of the zine inserted in italics right after that, and I won't play a game that gives me situations. I want to make up my own. We have two sides. We have the guys who want to make up their own adventures and build their own universe and the guys who don't have time or don't want to spend the time making that up, they want us to provide it. We got a lot of demand for people to make up stories for us to play. And so after about a year of just producing the game itself without adventures, we started producing adventures. Mm -hmm. People wanted them. People were looking for them. Anything, you know, if, let's explore this ancient strange structure let's explore this ship let's go do this mercenary operation with the military thing that's going on mm -hmm. let's explore this world let's be marooned on a world and have to get back to civilization all of those ideas are things that people want to play they can make them up themselves mm -hmm. but they wanted to buy it on the shelf and not have to make it up themselves have something to play that night when they got home that's a big help to gms because really i mean well you know there uh, as a gm there's a lot of prep work and if some of that could be offloaded into a pre-made module that you can that's kind of standalone that you can just stick into your game that has a high value and, so and, and you know no no plan survives contact with the enemy no 
module, no pre-written adventure survives contact with the game master. Mm -hmm. He changes this, he changes that, he wants this different. You know, you know, Dungeons and Dragons origins were in miniatures. The, the people who did Dungeons and Dragons were used to playing with little lead figures they painted up and multi-sided dice. They were used to that because that's the miniatures area. Traveler was strongly influenced by board war games because that was our background. So we moved quickly to hex maps and uh, die cut counters mm -hmm. in that area rather than the miniatures area. We eventually did miniatures. I enjoy miniatures. There's plenty of fun to do with miniatures. But uh, we wanted to give deck plans for ships instead of models of ships. Uh, how did you decide to just do like a, uh, the, on the maps, to just do like a flat, like slice? Instead of like, I mean, how did you do it? Well, you know, I'm, I know like making a 3D map would be a nightmare. Um, so, but how did you just decide? Mm -hmm. We had looked at doing it. We had information on 3D space and it just did not add to the experience mm. of players you know um just like a, a realistic science fiction game role-playing game that acknowledged that you can't go faster than the speed of light is not nearly as much fun as space opera where you can go to the stars mm -hmm. and see other worlds right well we also uh, 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 two points determine a line. It's th that's two dimensional. I'm, if I'm going from here to there, that's all I need is the two dimensional flat map. Mm -hmm. It's easier to understand. It's easier to play with. And adding a third dimension did not add an especially lot of information or fun in our play tests. And so mm -hmm. we stayed with flat maps. So what, what were some of the biggest challenges you faced designing and publishing travel over the years, and how have you uh, overcome them? Biggest challenges is getting in front of players who want to play and uh, telling them how great Traveler is. You know, a challenge, I think a lot of people pick it up and they know exactly what it does when they pick it up, and they just go with it. Dungeons & Dragons has a strong appeal to all kinds of people. All kinds, you know, frankly, let's see how to express this. In American society today, every kid, when he's between 10 and 12, encounters Dungeons and Dragons. Doesn't mean he plays it. Doesn't mean he understands it. It doesn't mean he enjoys it. But every kid in America somehow encounters it. And if it resonates with them, they get into it. Maybe they get into it hard. Maybe they prefer being on the baseball team. I don't know. But it is a new experience for them. Just like, you know, I remember when I was 12, I encountered Monopoly. Mm -hmm. We play Monopoly. It, it's a game. Everybody knows it. Everybody learns how to play Monopoly at some point in their life. If you really get into it, that's fine. If you don't, but there's a point where you learn how to play it. And by the time, and so everybody in America kind of knows how to play Monopoly. Right. But uh, today, everybody in America kind of knows how to play Dungeons and Dragons. And it's a generic term because they may not be playing with the D&D &D rules, but they at least know how to create a character and how to go from there. Right, and they understand what that means to play. I, I've noticed, uh, I, heard, I heard on the news the other night, somebody referencing D&D, &D, and I was like, wow, it's crazy that like a news, somebody on the news, like a newscaster was uh, yeah. talking about, you know, some D&D &D thing. <laughs> I don't remember what, I wish I rem remembered, but I was amazed at the time. It's like, look, I told my wife, look, it's just like snuck into pop, you know, pop culture. It's part of <laughs> and you know, there are people who get into it, but the fantasy does not work for them. You know, um, I get emails all the time from people who rediscover Traveler or mm -hmm. have always been in Traveler. But they they talk about how at that point somewhere when they were 10 or 12 or in high school, they learned about Dungeons and Dragons. They learned about role playing. They discovered Traveler. Mm -hmm. Traveler is what resonated with them. That's what happened to me. They, mm -hmm. They did not read well. They did not, math didn't work for them. Mm -hmm. There are challenges that they had. And 
Traveler helped them, you know, become an astrophysicist. I mean, my goodness. It must be uh, that, it must be very rewarding for you. Made them, yeah, <laughs> it's not Traveler that made them an astrophysicist. They had that in them all the time. Traveler right. was a mechanism which helped them understand. Mm -hmm. One of the stories I tell is that my grandson, who was eight at the time, wanted to play Traveler. You know, he... And, and playing with an eight-year-old is different than playing with a teen because they just want to, they're not quite sure what they were doing, but they want to play with grandfather. And so, but anyway, I sent him off. I, I told him how to generate a character. I sent him off and generated a character. He generated a character and came back. And I don't, and he made it up. He he worked with the information I gave him. He came back and he had a, a Varber character named Coots who had 2 billion credits. And I don't know to my this day, how he got two billion credits, but he did. Uh -huh. He knew enough how many zeros there were in a billion, and he had two and nine zeros and eight of. So, so, you know, you you deal with a an eight year old different than you do a teen, and so he went on an adventure and he got in his spaceship and they went up and and uh, I prefixed everything with space, you know. He went to this space restaurant and had lunch. He mm -hmm. went to this space space fuel station and got fuel. Uh -huh. And it all just worked. It resonated. We had a wonderful time. He ate but, a space burger. <laughs> yeah. But literally, he had uh, bought lunch at the space restaurant. Mm -hmm. And I said it was 22 credits, you know. And so he laboriously subtracted 22 from his 2 billion credits. <laughs> and then he had 1,900,000. And I really had to respect that. He was confident enough that he could subtract and carry and borrow enough to, mm -hmm. to change from two billion to two billion minus twenty-two. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and and then also that, like you know, not realizing that when you have two billion dollars, you don't really have to track two dollars. You know? <laughs> <laughs> That's the other thing that not realize the rounding error. Um, but, but the self-confidence that he had is, is one of those things that, that I, I enjoy and, and admire about role-playing. That there's a magazine, there's 17, a magazine, and one of my realizations somewhere in my life is that it's not for 17-year-olds, it's for 12-year-old girls. And it's filled with heartthrob interviews with, with romantic leads, what eyeshadow does and all these things about role-playing as a modern girl and it, it, it it's educating them about about gender roles and everything else the equivalent in in for boys is boys life which unfortunately and i say unfortunately was all about boy scouting and maybe sports mm -hmm. um and role-playing whether it's Traveler or Dungeons and Dragons or anything else, is for those young men, works for those young men, to teach them modern social and employment skills. I mean, they know how to add and subtract. They know how to plan a trip because if they don't remember to pack the food on their little expedition that they're making, they run out. They you know, mm -hmm. Traveler is filled with having enough fuel to get there, and if you run out, you've got a problem. Right. Um, it's about life support. It's about navigating on uh, in a strange area. Mm -hmm. so uh, choosing to that. negotiate instead of fight. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Great survival <laughs> skill there. <laughs> and and I think that that American society, a society in general, is better for having this role playing system available for them to kind of experiment with being an adult and doing something mm -hmm. instead of just being thrown on it once somewhere after they get out of high school high school doesn't teach you most high school does not teach you most of these skills and uh, they're valuable skills to have yeah if they had uh, taught um algebra by gaming i would have learned it faster <laughs> actually i was already doing algebra not realizing it so there you go <laughs> that or vectors or um vector uh the uh, i mentioned the other day the metric system uh never would have mastered the metric system without traveler because in american society there's no application for it aside from maybe fixing your car with metric tools you know <laughs> but uh, yeah we just don't use it at all mm -hmm. you know 
Harry Potter taught, showed that a lot of kids who didn't think they could read could read. You know, Dungeons and Dragons and Traveler do the same thing. That at some point, our company had a, a reading analysis done of the rules we were writing, and of Dungeons and Dragons rules. You know, and the the, the reading level of those books is is twelfth grade, early college in some mm -hmm. cases. Right. And um, and a kid who is not considered to be a good reader can pick these things up, and he wants to know what they are. Mm -hmm. And he will read with wonderful comprehension mm -hmm. because he cares. And that's something that we kind of lose out on, miss out on. It's the motivation that makes us achieve. Role-playing, gaming, fiction, Harry Potter, all those mm -hmm. things are just the tools that help kids understand that they have the ability to do something right if, you never know where that motivation is going to come from right that's right right that's do you have any uh exciting new developments uh for the traveler five universe coming out with any we were just talking about adventures and how people like you to provide adventures you're gonna um put out a line of adventures or um what do you what do you got going on at traveler five we're working on on some adventures it's kind of slow going you know traveler we've, we've got two parallel Traveler game systems out there, Mongoose Traveler mm -hmm. and Traveler 5. Mm -hmm. And uh, they kind of have set, you may recall that when we produced Traveler, the first version, mm -hmm. uh, it was three little black books. And then dozens of little black books after that. Right. Collaborating on high guard space combat or mercenary ground combat or exploration in the scouts or merchant prints and all those details well and then we've gone through several editions many editions and uh traveler five takes all of that thought and makes a coherent whole out of it mm -hmm. of course it's it's eight nine hundred pages right now it's um, a sci-fi gaming compendium but it's like everything it you need uh, it's like a framework for every kind of thing and, you know, Matthew Sprange at Mongoose asks me a question sometimes and says, you know, what about this? And I pull out Traveler 5, and, and there I have something about technological levels or, or ideas or making things or, or all those answers that the ultimate system is Traveler 5. Mm -hmm. But it's... It, the tool toolkit, the ultimate toolkit for the game master mm -hmm. who wants to make things up. Right. On the other hand, Mongoose Traveler is a great thing with pre-generated rule uh, scenarios or universes or everything else, and he's doing a great job. I I don't mean to say you should play Traveler Five, but not Mongoose Traveler. My mm -hmm. idea is you should be following Mongoose Traveler religiously. But you should have Traveler 5 for those things that you want to make up yourself. Yeah, those, that's a good way to have those two uh, product lines complement each other. You know, you know, and Traveler 5 is making use of all of the lessons that we've had over time. That we had uh, Classic Traveler, and then we had Traveler uh, Mega Traveler, and then we had New Era. We had something called Fire Fusion and Steel, which is mm -hmm. uh, a, trying to have rules on making on building the things that you wanted to build, ships and uh, weapons and uh, all kinds of things. Mm -hmm. It's a construction system, fire, fusion, and steel. Right. Um, but you had to have an engineering degree to do that. <laughs> it was extremely re trying to be extremely realistic. And so Traveler 5 unders uh, took learned that lesson and in created something instead what I call makers, the way to build a, a robot or a, an Android or iPad or whatever mm -hmm. without necessarily have to, having to understand the engineering details behind it. Because we've learned some lessons in some words, some, some natural dead ends that we had to revise and change and make it easier for players to use. And that's what Traveler 5 does. It's really, I'm very happy with Traveler 5. And I think that anybody who's playing Traveler should have that set. It's a major investment. Mm -hmm. But it's there to really help you understand all the depth of detail possible in the system.
most adventurers don't use a lot of detail. They just go somewhere and do something and shoot some guy and come back and leave. <laughs> my, pl my players are a little bit more subtle they drown them in the creek <laughs> okay, no, Very subtle. um so um <laughs> yeah i love i love big thick rule books uh the my uh, uh, uh i like the uh hero system like i used to play champions and still do now and then but uh like the the hero system five book is like ginormous and uh, when i saw how big the uh traveler five book was i was like yes <laughs> you see and you are my natural customer <laughs> drool uh, yes <laughs> um all right so let's talk about uh the traveler community and um the game's been around for over 40 years so what do you think has been the key to its enduring popularity out in the sci-fi gaming community you know, there are many kinds of Traveler players. Traveler has always lent itself to what I call solitaire play. You know, that, that you can have an enjoyable evening creating worlds or characters or starships. You can have an enjoyable session all by yourself making something or building something in Traveler. Mm -hmm. Um you may tell yourself that you're preparing for an adventure that you're going to run with your players. <laughs> <laughs> but the truth is you're going to enjoy that preparation session for itself. Um, there are, you know, I used to have a, a, a gaming group during my classic traveler period that did not know anything about the rules. Mm -hmm. They just told me what they wanted to do. They enjoyed sitting around, on the couch or we weren't sitting in front of a map we were just sitting around and i was telling them you've landed on this world and they and what are you going to do and they would tell me what they wanted to do and i would resolve it and they enjoyed self-telling an adventuresome story um and and they were not constrained by the rules like they um do you know what a rat guard is on a hawser so a hawser is a um the rope that ties a ship to the dock. Okay. Okay, and a rat guard is kind of like a Victorian collar that your dog gets. It's just a, a metal cone that they tie that they put on the on the rope so the rats can't climb up onto the ship. And so I, you know, um, my players had landed on this on this world, and unfortunately, there was a a mass of space badgers <laughs> they had to walk through <laughs> to get to the treasure you know that's what mm -hmm. they had to do you know you know it just it was just the whole ground was covered with little toothy badgers that were terrible uh -huh. and so so they um devised a bunch of badger boots they call them <laughs> which big big a big kind of skirt around them so the badgers couldn't climb up their legs and then they waded through the badgers to get to the treasure and get it and get back to the ship. You know? It still sticks with me because mm -hmm. there are no rules for making badger boots. They just right. said what they wanted to do. We figured out how to do them. I hoped that none of them would trip and fall in the sea of, of ravening badgers. But they enjoy, you know, that was their imagination on how they were going to do it. And mm -hmm. they did it, and they enjoyed it. I enjoyed it. I still remember that episode 40 years later. Uh -huh. Because I don't, you know, that's the magic, not just of Traveler, but of role-playing, is that the ideas that come from the players mm -hmm. tell us the story. Yeah, it's... I cannot make up stories the way they can, as they literally live as the characters and get through this. Right. And uh, but that's the beauty of role playing, isn't it? It's the shared. Um, we're all imagining the same scene. We all have a different view of it in our heads, but yes. at the same time, we also have a common point of reference. And so, right. you know, one of my players, um, they were sneaking up on a on a space station and the space station was in an asteroid field and um so they parked the ship behind uh, some big asteroid kind of like in the sensor blind spot and then they sent one guy in uh, with his grav belt 
in a spacesuit to fly onto the uh, space station. And he's, uh, he's the engineer, so he got on their sensor array and misaligned it so the ship could come in i mean it was like all this big crazy complicated boob goldberg thing that they came up with and everybody rolled well and they rescued the scientists from the space station yeah Yeah. and so but there was you know tense moments of flying yourself in your spacesuit through the asteroid field and asteroids flying around and you know you have to dodge them and not get detected and you know it's uh yeah it's just a fun fun game and so creative and 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 so often these people see things that we don't see you know that that what crazy mind is there that comes up with that Mm -hmm. and they do you know Mm -hmm. and 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 it is as much fun it is more fun than some of these television dramas right no so fun i mean because everybody got to pitch in the the pilot had to park the ship just so the engineer had to put down all the uh the levels of energy so that they you know didn't get scanned the the guy who's doing the spacewalk had to you know have good vac suit skills and everybody got a little chance to shine on this mission and um so that's that's uh that's what makes it uh, enduring for me as a player and gm is um just all the crazy stuff that happens at the gaming table is just so funny and like to talk about for years to come <laughs> i know i agree <laughs> So can you talk about how the Traveler community has evolved over the years and uh, what role you see it playing in the future of the game? Like, how was it at first? Did, I mean, there was at first just so few players, and now, I mean, there's like, it's all over the internet, and so many, it seems to be undergoing a renaissance. So back there when we started this, when I was this, I say this unusually creative period, writing this and playing with my fellow, my co-workers at Game Designers Workshop, as well as we were just playing because it was fun. I mean, we, nobody gave a thought to anything except this was fun and we were enjoying it. You know, there were the, there's still this undercurrent of is, is Dungeons and Dragons satanic and, uh, you know. A stranger Things isn't helping. <laughs> yeah. 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 Uh, yeah. Uh, you know, I remember the uh, the the accusations. There was literally a um, um, of the mazes and monsters and and people committing suicide. Mm-hmm. There, there was I I'm always struck by this. It's not traveler so much as Dungeons and Dragons, but the brilliant people in the industry tackled that problem. And here's what they said. There's a criticism that Dungeons and Dragons players end up killing themselves because we have some instances. And so they compiled a list. The game, the game people then took that list and said, okay, you're making your best possible case that Dungeons and Dragons is dangerous for children, for kids. Here's all these lists of people. And you know, if you analyze the list, this kid was into drugs and he played Dungeons and Dragons and he mm-hmm. died of an overdose. You know, mm-hmm. I wonder what the cause of that was. You know, right. this kid had a, um, a a troubled childhood or and and all this stuff. But but the the game people then said, let's just take their list at face value. They've given us, they've scoured the statistics. They've given us a list of as every possible suicide connection with Dungeons and Dragons. Mm-hmm. They got a number. We looked at sales numbers. We looked at how many people play Dungeons and Dragons. They got the number for the suicide rate in America for teens in general. And then they compared the numbers. And the suicide rate for kids who play Dungeons and Dragons is an order of magnitude lower than the general suicide rate in America. That means that Dungeons and Dragons kids who played playing Dungeons and Dragons inoculates against suicide. Mm -hmm. You should encourage your kids to play Dungeons and Dragons because it actively statistically lessens the chance of them committing suicide. That's the truth about this hobby. Mm -hmm. And then we, and I go from there. We wanted to play this game because it was fun. We wanted to play role playing because we enjoyed it today. 40 years later, it's a major mainstream hobby that every kid knows about 
and the kids who want to play do that we have grandfathers playing with grandsons we mm-hmm. have parents playing with children the largest convention in the state of indiana annually is gen con which is a gaming convention it's not some thing convention or anything else it's role playing and it gets more people there than the, it, you can imagine mm-hmm. so so what we changed is we just started it because it was a game a, a, an endeavor that we enjoyed we still enjoy it mm-hmm. more people enjoy it than ever and it's a good wholesome hobby I mean, right and, and I'll, I'll go one step farther the um the kids the, the youth at my church mm-hmm. play role playing in the basement when they are in the church fooling around but who would expect and i didn't expect that but they yeah that's come a long way um has come a long way from being kind of a spooky thing that people didn't understand to just being more mainstream and people just realizing um you know uh, if you're religious or whatever, God gave you gave you a brain, you know, and you should use it. You know, <laughs> uh, He gave you a creativity, and uh, this is a way to express that. Um, so, uh, but that's my opinion, you know. I'll mm-hmm. go one step farther because role playing lets people experiment with things that are hard to experiment with in real life. I. This is kind of a triggering story, but you know, I at, at one point these were some teens, probably a high school junior or senior, playing um, Dungeons and Dragons, and they were looting and burning a village. Mm-hmm. They were attacking it, and and they were going through, and they were very methodically killing the villagers and burning the village huts. You know, and I, oh my goodness, I beyond me, I but they were doing it, and. Uh, I have to say, they got that out of their system. <laughs> Thankfully, no real villagers were harmed during this game. <laughs> yes, no real villagers were harmed. But yeah, I guess everybody does, guys, like, try, like, let's be anti-heroes. Let's see if we can, you know, what's it like to be the bandit, you know? Or what's it like to be the right. warlord or, you know? Um, and then you realize it's not really rewarding or, I don't know, not for me. I guess some people, you know, that's kind of like... I don't know if this is related or whatever, but this brings to mind uh, the TV show MASH that showed that, you know, war is not glorious. War is guts and blood and intestines and, you know, uh, misery. Uh, And uh, I think that role playing can kind of teach the same sorts of things virtually you know on a on a virtual battlefield and you're uh through through the experience of the game uh no i know it's not the same as like real battle but you're you know you can get a taste for what kind of things happen on a battlefield and then decide you know that's not really for me and maybe 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 glorifying violence was not such a great idea <laughs> or you know whatever it's like you say work it out of your system and, and go you know it's much more fun trying to become a rich merchant or exploring strange new worlds or uh you know fighting people only when we have to um you know and, and exercising their brain mm-hmm. exercising their so developing their social skills mm-hmm. yes yeah because vaporizing everything you come across doesn't really advance any story <laughs> right <laughs> so um well i think we already addressed that question i was gonna ask you what, what do you think tra- sets traveler apart from other tabletop rpgs what, why should someone try uh traveler out as opposed to uh you know getting into D D or whatever there are some people who like fantasy there are some people who like science fiction mm-hmm. there's some people dungeons and dragons is about heroic fantasy traveler is about science fiction and it's about problem solving mm-hmm. you know there are adventures there's reasons to go there but but it's about problem solving understanding working out what process you will use to achieve your goals forget the educational aspects forget the the, the socialization aspects all the things that we as parents want our children to involve themselves with just in involving yourself put yourself in the story this is a way to tell a story, to enjoy, and to flex your mental muscles and enjoy yourself 
it, it, it is, there are so many different ways of resolving issues and there are so many different people and how they do it. And that interplay is entertaining, but it's also a, a kind of self understand, gaining an understanding of self that, that any introspective person after they've played this under, it's not just traveler, anything. Mm -hmm. Role playing helps you understand yourself, mm -hmm. um, and having a good time doing it. Right. So, Mark, have you tried other? Uh, have you played other uh, sci-fi role playing games? Uh, ever done like Alternity or um, or uh, Space Opera or um, uh, you know I, Gamma World or any other sci-fi? Uh... I certainly played those at the. At, I, I certainly played. Um, um, Metamorphosis Alpha when it first came out, I wanted mm -hmm. to see what that was. Starfaring, Star Frontiers. I enjoy Cthulhu. Uh, I, I just think that concept is just just brilliant. Um, the the I sanity enjoy, loss and so forth, the going the mad. Uh -huh. I mean, I've stolen that. That's in Traveler Five. You know, uh -huh. you have you have sanity if you care to track that. You know, um, uh, and and I, I'm 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 going to veer off for a minute because. There, there are tools within Traveler that let you address things that sometimes you, some specific people want to address. Sanity is one of them. I mean, in, in Cthulhu, it's, you know, desperately trying to understand what's going on before you devolve into insanity. You know, and cart it Traveler, off to the sanitarium. <laughs> yeah. yeah. You know, but, but Traveler has a, a, a not very well-developed process of dealing with mental health issues. And so you can play a character who has a mental health issue. Mm -hmm. And uh, um, it, it's not very well-developed, but it's there. And I think that some people would benefit by playing that mm -hmm. to see how that influences their life one of the one of the things um i uh appreciated from the hero system was their disadvantage system you get so many points to build your character but you can get some extra bonus points if you take disadvantages and the disadvantages could be things like you have a code against killing or you um you're enraged when you see you know somebody getting bullied or you know, have psychological limitations you could have you could be addicted to drugs you could be uh you could have a dependent npc you know who's like your aunt may or whatever you have to kind of take care of her and uh keep her you know yeah, you have yeah. a secret identity yeah. to maintain you know all of these things and it kind of makes a th brings your character to life because you're like oh, no i can't kill the bad guy i have a code against killing i could i have to just call the police and hold them here until they get here or you know whatever and it really adds like an extra dimension onto the game so i always encourage people if they can get into your character you know get game get books like uh, i have this um rpg um character backstory book um yeah, yeah. yeah no, there's uh yeah. heroes of tomorrow the uh, central casting um you know, plus, you know, regular Mongoose Traveler gives you life events and you can really play off of those. And, um, agree, and, uh, yeah. yeah. You know, I, I, I read something somewhere. I saw something where they said you're, you're adventuring and you encounter a guy with an eye patch and missing a hand and you wonder, oh no, <laughs> what did he dump those stats into? <laughs> <laughs> Let's move on to our next question, which is, uh, can you discuss the impact that Traveler's had on the wider sci-fi genre, um, both in gaming and in pop culture? Like, I've heard rumors that um, Joss Whedon's Firefly was heavily influenced by uh, Traveler, and then now the upcoming Starfield video game, uh, people are talking about how, how reminiscent it is of Traveler. Do you have any insight on that? You know, Traveler's benefits by being the first. Uh, you know, I, we can quibble about which was, i say, the first major science fiction role-playing game. And I think it has set a standard that, that games are still trying to, to beat, that, that they may do something better in one way or another, but Traveler really handles the basic structure of science fiction role-playing, that any other role-playing game, science fiction role-playing game, I, I think they've struggled to do better, and I don't know that they have. Of course, Starfield is based on Traveler, you know, mm -hmm. because Traveler is its basic foundation. It's not just Star Trek, not just Starfield, but you know, elite 
wing commander and mm -hmm. wing star wing citizen pro you know mm -hmm. elite uh-huh it's funny when people uh, talk about those games they say it's like traveler it's like video game traveler um yeah, you know yeah. so well, that's what they say yeah and and you know so starfield has all probably 25 worlds yeah. oh that's cute you've got 25 <laughs> worlds uh, i've got 25 worlds on this page <laughs> go over here uh -huh. um, but we just give you the codes and you can make them up yourself you can, uh -huh. um you can you have to interpret the codes to understand what they are they of course have detailed them in much more detail right uh, but you know i'm uh, frankly of course you know anybody worth his salt who's going to sit down and start doing a role-playing game or a computer game is going to look at the existing literature and mm -hmm. and uh, I, I i'm prejudiced when i say this but if you're going to look at the existing literature so you go out and buy a bunch of science fiction role-playing games here's traveler here's gamma world here's metamorphosis alpha and here's um star frontiers mm -hmm. which one are you going to base it on right you base it on traveler because traveler deals with all the things you need to know at the foundation and you say okay i'm going to change how spaceships work but you changing from something that is a basic structure and then you do it because it fits what you're trying to achieve i'm going to change how worlds work yes but you're going to keep most of it and then change the details you're going to add some detail that you think is important but the mm -hmm. foundation is there. Of course, they based it on travel. Right, right. So, how do you balance the needs of uh, veterans players who've been uh, gaming for decades with the needs of newer players who might be unfamiliar? I'm working on something like that. We have free RPG day, and I'm working towards something for that. Mm -hmm. But when I think about it, I'm not going to teach people how to play role playing. I'm not. And that just that's not our purpose. First of all, they encountered Dungeons and Dragons and somebody rolled the dice for them the first time and they have some idea of what it is. And I think you think about free RPG day. So somebody's going to uh, these game stores are going to have a free RPG, but it's mostly for the the choir that already is singing the praises of role playing. They come in and they get it to add to their collection. Mm -hmm. Those are not reaching out to most new untried uneducated untrained unexperienced people who want to get into gaming or don't even know if they want to get into gaming i had something i ran at gen con some time ago and i'm working on a, rev a, a revision of that i don't think it's so much for free rpg day as just handing out all year long which is a character generator mm -hmm. for somebody who's brand new you know, here's what this is about here's how to generate your character Here's which character means at the end of it. Here's how old he is. Here's what his rank is. Here's what he owns. He's got this gun. He's got this, this tickets to go somewhere. All of those, those sparks that prompt you to want to do something. Some rules in the back about how you use your characters to resolve issues or set tasks or whatever. Mm -hmm. That is what brings new people into the hobby. Mm -hmm. Of course, most of the time it's there because an experienced person hands it to someone who's expressed some interest right that's what we want to do is give that to people and they'll either be interested or they won't i can't make them want to play but mm -hmm. we need a tool and that's the tool that i'm actually i was working on it earlier today that's the tool that's a great idea that's a good idea because when people have that character now they want to play um yeah. and uh, i've experienced that mm-hmm I was running a game at uh, Bubonicon, and um, I made some pre-generated characters. And at the end of the game, when I I told the people, "Go ahead and take your character," it was like they won a prize. You know, they looked so <laughs> excited and happy to walk away with the uh, with the character that they played for you know a few hours. So uh, Let's see if I can have that for you next year. Let's see yeah. if I can have a, a character generator for you next year. Yeah, yeah, that'd be great. And we'll and we'll do something to to have all your people who then will have them to hand out to their people who. Mm -hmm. Express interest. 
Yeah. And it's like, you know, the thing with uh, people will say, oh, well, you know, you do in session zero where everybody rolls up their characters. But as soon as you have your character you want to play. So session zero is never like a standalone session or it's very hard to keep it that way. And go, okay, now you've rolled up your character. See you guys next week. <laughs> <You know? laughs> oh, well, you know, I want to play now. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> so, all right. So, uh, so Mark, what's your favorite traveler thing? Like uh, you have a favorite ship or a favorite uh, planet or a favorite empire <laughs> um, <laughs> what's the th you what's know, the thing I'm, that that you're like happy that you're like most proud about or like you really like about traveler but, you know i want to i'll just favorite one favorite thing there is no one favorite thing you know we've got a traveler wiki traveler wiki you can look up all of this lore the 40 years of traveler and it, it it's beautiful it's filled with facts and details and Somebody can mention something, you can look it up, there it is. I use it all the time. Mm -hmm. It's easier than looking it up in my books because it's right there. Yeah, and it's they've uh, everything's got citations, and uh, it's great. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. There's Traveler Map, which is all of charted space on um, 2D. 2D. Mm -hmm. you, know, you can look up any one, and there's all kinds of experimental things. You can make posters of your, of your sector. You can... Mm -hmm. you know, custom information in and make posters and mm -hmm. printouts and and all that sort of stuff there's yep. a button you can push to map the world orbiting the star I'm talk about wonderful resources for mm -hmm. game masters right and yeah. these are all uh, community ba uh, community uh, produce content joshua bell uh is the guy behind traveler maps i don't know who originated uh the traveler wiki forgive me whoever you are um well, and not, not to snub you i just don't know <laughs> so that's what matters mm -hmm. um, uh, favorite i mean those things are just wonderful things second dynasty is doing um oh the 3d printed, 3D printed chips mm -hmm. for, 3, for 3d printed chips i just mm -hmm. ordered a beowulf mm -hmm. you know and, uh, and uh, you know, think about it. I had to make those maps for the Beowulf, the deck plans, a long time ago, and then mm -hmm. he's gone through and makes them work in 3D. Yep, it's just incredible. Yeah, I was watching them do it on Twitch. He had a uh, had like a CAD program, and he was going, "Hmm, now this this ramp underneath the ship doesn't have clearance for cargo bay cargo pods to come on board. So we're going to have to come up with a different way. And yeah, it was, it was cool. Cause it was kind of open to the public to um, have input while he was doing the design and uh, they did a really great yeah. job. And one of my, one of my players from Canada actually as a gift sent me a Beowulf uh, 3d printed model. And I used it for the, uh, uh, if, if you see the, uh, the traveler um, banner for this year's May day, that's actually, uh, it's not a 3d rendered uh, Beowulf. It's an actual, physical uh beowulf that i've filmed against this green screen <laughs> then it set it on fire uh, virtually <laughs> we, we need to get hasbro to make make you know those in a box and sell them at walmart oh yeah man micro machines of traveler uh you yeah. know stuff that would be yeah. epic all right so uh let's uh move on to the future of uh traveler um so one big thing in the news these days is uh, artificial intelligence. It's becoming uh, more and more prevalent. And also, uh, we see a lot of it in sci-fi settings like AI, rogue AIs that go crazy, you know, of the Matrix and stuff like that. How do you see AI evolving in the future? And um, how, how do you see, how, how can we incorporate it into our traveler universe? I think we have a responsibility to know what the AI is doing and not having it victimize um, the support community that we have. By that, I mean, I think that for the game master, the game player who wants a picture, it's easy to go to AI and say, draw me a picture of a spaceport. I mean, that's no different than, uh, to me, that is no different than going to Google Images and asking for a spaceport picture. But I think AI as uh, AI produced art or AI produced narratives need to be more carefully vetted before we start publishing them. Mm -hmm. I bought a, a role I bought a role playing module of some sort. I don't even remember what it was now, but it was illustrated with AI art. And and I could recognize that it was AI art and it just I could tell that it was soulless. It was no, and, and boy, it, that tells me something about AI. You know? mm -hmm. That that 
I look at art by Ann Stead or Brian Gibson or uh, any David Dietrich. I mean, there there is a spark of imagination in there. And AI seems to take the art, the pictures, and just take any take take away that spark of light. Right, because it's just procedural. I mean, it's making a it's making a picture based on like a static uh, image of static, and then it starts like refining that and and working backwards to a picture, and so it's right. just it's it's a mathematical thing, and it comes across that way. I think. Right, and mm-hmm. it does, and 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 uh, you know um, now. I'll say that sometimes I can tell a real person mm-hmm. to draw me a picture, and it comes across not understanding what I want. Mm-hmm. You know that 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 which re, which then tells us how important the imagination of the artist is mm-hmm. for our perceptions. You know, it's not just AI that there are artists who don't understand how to make pictures that reflect the the grandeur of science fiction mm-hmm. i mean they could do a nice they can do a a, a nice pedestrian picture of something I mean, you know it's not just ais that are procedural but uh, there there's are there's technical art artists. right yeah there's te- and, and there are there are artists who just have you know brushes in photoshop that mm-hmm will do something or, right. or, or procedurals that will just take a picture of a person and turn it into a caricature. Um, you know, you can find a lot of, of um, freelancers, uh, freelance artists who you ask them to do a picture and they basically, all they're doing is, is, you know, I can, he says, I can convert your thing to a comic book style. Well, he's right. applying a brush to a picture that you provide him. That's kind of an artificial intelligence too. I think that we have to be very careful on what we let AI do for us. Mm-hmm. Um, so uh, how do you see it like in your sci-fi setting? Uh, like if you had, let's say you had AI that controls your ship, is it something you got to worry about? Is it, is it, does it take the place as like an NPC uh, where it has like um, its own motivations or is it just like a, an assistant that runs the ship? You know, okay. So classic traveler, mega traveler, new era. New Era introduced the virus. It right. got away. Now, now we talk, you know, and that's based on something from Classic Traveler about the little little guy on some world, you know, silicon-based, electron-based intelligence. And, and so we have these vampire fleets running around, insane AI. But, you know, artificial intelligence, it, it'd be hard to just impose artificial intelligence on the traveler community. On the traveler universe mm-hmm. it's imposed with through the virus and we've been playing with that and you know insane entities are not survival prone because they're not handling things and so i envision a, that and, and i've been working with some people about this concept that several hundred years later after the virus some of those ships are run by artificial intelligences mm-hmm. They can't, they can't get repaired. They can't get services if they're insane. They have to kind of go through a process of no longer being insane. They're just intelligent. The survival factor is they become sane. Mm-hmm. They have a moral code. Right. They are multiple iterations beyond that insane, killing thing, murderous AI. And they have to become more realistic more mm-hmm. sane right you know, i think that that's an interesting character is someone who has a history in sanity as a as an artificial intelligence and now is very careful to not be because that's the only way it can survive right that's that's a great character that is that's an interesting you take that, you can download that intelligence into a robot and he can go with the guys when they go wandering around on the on the surface right you know, we can impose we can impose controls and say that he doesn't have all of his intelligence in the robot it doesn't all fit right but um, you know, or the robot doesn't have robot. guns right no guns for the robot <laughs> oh no we let guns have, we let, let robots have, don't believe in the, in the three laws for asimov for our robots <laughs> or maybe he is maybe he has decided that he's going to eschew uh, or abjure violence mm-hmm. just because of his history. 
All right. What a role playing what a role playing opportunity for a player. Right, yeah, yeah, it is. Another big thing in the news was um the fiasco with uh um Wizards of the Coast Open G L gaming uh, lessons. Yeah. <laughs> uh, do you have any opinions on that or um do do you have plans to do you do open gaming license for Traveler 5, or what's your thoughts on open uh, gaming licenses in general? We have an, we have an open gaming license for um, Traveler, for Mongoose Traveler. Um, it's being revised. I, I think the biggest problem that the open gaming license fiasco had was Hasbro talked about canceling the license, which does not understand the, what that license was. All of a sudden, they started quibbling about whether it really was a perpetual license and wanting to, I don't know, erase it or cancel it or change it or do something. And I just thought that was wrong. We have, uh, we, Mongoose, has an open gaming license and it has a thriving market for things like that. Mm-hmm. I was looking at the other day, six or seven people who are actively publishing things under the open gaming license <clears throat> for travel. It doesn't hurt Traveler to have open game license. It helps Traveler. I totally support the open game license and these people who are doing what they're doing. And you can hear what I'm saying. I don't, the open game license is already in place. Mm-hmm. It doesn't mean that there will always be an open gaming license for every new title edition. But there's an open gaming license in existence now. And that should never go away. Uh, do you have third parties making licensed uh, content for Traveler 5, or is it all produced by you? Um, I've got a couple. I've got um, uh, one is Traveler Ascension. It's a board game. Uh, I think that's fun. Um, we've got um, uh, the, oh, let's see. The Traveler, oh, yeah, I love that. Those are great. That's a great game. Playing Traveler Custom Multiple Card Game. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I, that's just a, a fun, different way of playing Traveler, and I, I, I love that. Uh, Cheese Weasel with, is doing some some card games as well. They did a bag of coins for the drawing. Oh, yes, I saw that. Uh, mm-hmm. That was fun. Those are the ones that on the top of my head. But, uh, and sec- is Second Dynasty's licensed stuff? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah. Um, so what advice would you give to aspiring game designers who are looking to create their own tabletop RPG? If you look at, at Amazon, I'm kind of divergent, digressing here, it's possible now to create a, to, to publish your novel or your memoirs or your biography, autobiography as a book and sell dozens of them. <laughs> I've sold dozens of my book. How insightful. <laughs> You can get it for $25. <laughs> uh-huh. um, and uh, print on demand makes it possible to do that. But you'll sell dozens. If you do a role playing game and actually commit yourself to it, you can sell hundreds and even thousands of them through the game distribution market and at conventions. Mm-hmm. If you do a good job. Right. You know, if you do a good job on a novel, you still do, doesn't still doesn't necessarily mean you self publishing it can make it work. I think you have to self publish if you're going to write a, a role playing game. Um, I, the, the chance of you going to Hasbro and saying, "I want to do this role playing game," no, it take, I, I think you have to do it yourself. Mm. But you can buy booths at conventions and you can sell your product, and people who like it will love it and they'll talk about it, and you'll sell more. It's the it's the last free market area that self-publishing actually works. Do, uh, as a as a publisher, I mean, do people approach you with ideas and pitch ideas to you um, about like, I have this idea for Traveler 5 and I think it would be a really cool product. Uh, would you suggest people maybe work with existing publishers to kind of see what it's about before they go off and do their own thing? Or do you think um, somebody can just start from zero and, and make a, uh, uh, you know, a decent um, sellable game? I don't think that most of the, I think that most of the role-playing game publishers are already publishing what they want to publish and they have on staff writers doing it. Um, gotcha. Um, I think there are some really horror stories of people who are trying to write for an existing publisher 
and they get victimized because they don't get paid what they're worth. And uh, the publisher makes a lot of money. I'm thinking it's just recent scandals like that. Mm -hmm. um, but the way to do it is you want to write role playing stuff. You write your role. If, if you want to do, you can either attach yourself to an existing role playing game. You know, the open gaming license lets you do that. Mm -hmm. um, and you can publish it yourself. Right. If you're an aspiring, if you're an aspiring role playing game as opposed to support, but the game itself, you can do it. You can write your own game and market it yourself. It's a hard road. Right. At least it's possible. All right. That's uh, that's encouraging. <laughs> um, it's uh, you know making as a gamer and a, and a GM for my whole life. Uh, you know making my own game is kind of a dream and. I'm going to pursue it down the line here. So that's encouraging news. Can you uh, discuss be it? Sure to, be sure to ask me when you get further along. Okay, thanks a lot. <laughs> Can you discuss any uh, challenges or obstacles that you faced as a game designer due to uh, changes in technology or the gaming industry as a whole? The original Traveler was typed on a, um, a, a cold type IBM typesetter. Mm -hmm. um, we went to... The the original Spinwood Marches was, was computer generated on a Gromemco 100 bus um, in BASIC before we had any kind of uh, real computers out there. I mean, the com certainly pre PC Mega Traveler. Much of Mega Traveler was typeset on a on a non what you see is what you get interface where you actually had to type in the codes, kind of like HTML, oh. and then print it out on photo paper. Uh, like WordPerfect or whatever, back in the day? It wasn't even WordPerfect. It was HTML, mm. you know, with, with bracketed, uh, bold, unbold, mm. all that sort of font names. It was crazy. It is, if you wanted something in color, you had to send the stuff off to a, a color separator, and it would cost $1,000 to make the films to make a cover in color you know it was crazy today we have the, the best of all possible worlds mm -hmm. i mean you just haul it up and it, do it in indesign and it, it'll show you what it looks like at the end when you're done right um i remember going to kinko's and, and uh bringing um blank uh subsector <laughs> and making uh, yeah, copies yeah. and copies and copies and copies and you know because but now i just print them up now you just print them up mm -hmm. um uh, you know, at the same time, when when Game Designers Workshop first started doing games, they were pub they were packaged in brown corrugated cardboard boxes with the ends taped. I mean, and they're just kind of thrown in there. It had nice components, but there was no packaging to speak of. So we pioneered packaging those things in Ziploc bags with a cover sheet, mm -hmm. and they went in, and there were game stores, hobby stores that would carry them. And we were happy that they did. Today, packaging is extremely sophisticated. Marketing is extremely sophisticated. We have access with uh, online ordering and Amazon and all that. It's just amazing. It's been a great, it, it's a great ride. We've been enjoyed, I've enjoyed it. Mm -hmm. Boy, whippersnappers today just have life easy. <laughs> Uh, my wife and I were laughing the other day because I used to have a like a dot matrix impact printer and it would just <laughs> and be like I got a character sheet like 20 minutes later. <laughs> um, let's see. Uh, all right, just got a few more questions for you, and then we'll wrap this up. What do you think are the key elements uh, of a successful RPG campaign, and uh, how do you create and maintain them? Um, we looked at that once upon a time. I think that you have to have these, ba I call it the basics. You know, you have to have a universe, you can, whether it's a generic universe or not, whatever it is, you have to have this, this universe that everybody acknowledges the generic empire or hegemony or whatever it is that you live in. You have to have some sort of pull, I call it, that, that I want to get somewhere and do something. And you also, it helps to have a push, somebody chasing you behind that is constantly making you move forward. 
uh, you know, the, the police, the inspector, the the, the crime lord. Uh, yeah. yeah, whatever. Mm-hmm. Somebody. And uh, and there has to be some element of magic in this, and I don't mean magical magic. I mean some expression of wonder. You know that going to it, it doesn't have to be big. I had a, a trip which was canceled because this is real life. But I had a trip planned and it was canceled because of the of the pandemic. But I had reservations, Darlene and I were going to go to Ecuador because I wanted to get a piece of rock from the equator. You know, I don't need to find gold, I don't need to go gold mining or prospecting, but mm-hmm. I, it was kind of a magical item that I wanted to get. And it, it's not a big traveler adventure, but it was something that I wanted to do. Mm-hmm. I think that there has to be some element of, of wonder in your campaigns. If it's just, I want to buy some stuff here cheap and sell it on the next world and make money, that's not magical. Right. <laughs> has to be, you know, that you may be doing that for a living, but there has to be something more than just doing it for a living in there. Right. You also have to want to go, you know, you have two worlds, you can go to A or B. And A is just this regular world, and B has the uh, uh, national park with the tigers in it. I think we'll go to B. Whatever that is, there has to be some element that catches people's imaginations. Right, right. It could be like the cargo that you're hauling. You know, you have 20 tons of explodium, and you have to make sure you know um, you get it safely where it goes, and it's unstable. Or maybe pirates or, are after your cargo, or you know, the tiger in the cage. When you're going down in the hole, it talks to you. <clears throat> yeah, okay. Then something you didn't expect. Right, right. Um, all right. So in, in Traveler, there's uh, many different worlds and all kinds of aliens and uh, diverse uh, biomes and creatures and stuff. Um, how do you approach creating a diverse and inclusive setting and characters in the Traveler universe? You know, the very first book in Traveler had a comment that said, you can be anybody you want. You can be any gender. You can be any person. You can be anybody. And I put that in because I found that when I was playing, I had some woman char- women players who did not understand they could have woman characters. Uh, and I needed to make that point. The Traveler universe brands itself as cosmopolitan all kinds of social structures and eclectic opportunities for everybody yet it's human dominated it's it's male dominated it's it is not this magic wonder utopia that we think it is traveler i wrote asian of the imperium and I was afraid of writing a novel for the longest time. That's backwards, isn't it? <laughs> but anyway, good for you. Um, Mine might be flipped over. <laughs> but I, w- I wanted to I wanted to to talk about traveler, the traveler universe, and it's not perfect. It's still human. It's still yeah, and that's backward too. Don't. <laughs> <laughs> but you know, science fiction, fiction, prose fiction, lets us say different things than role playing does. Mm-hmm. And so, I heartily suggest if you haven't read it, not you, but you out there, if you haven't read it, read it. I mean, you can find it on Amazon. It's an ebook. It's cheap. It's easy to get to. It's fast reading. People who know Traveler like it. And you see insights into it that are not available in the role-playing rules. Mm -hmm. Um, And there are, we were talking, you were talking about earlier, you asked the question and we never got to it about psionics. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah, The psionics is prohibited in the Imperium. It's terrible. It's people peeping in our minds and we don't stand for that. And I had to do that. I, I put psionics in because it's kind of magic and it's it's a fantasy element. And 
people want to be able to have that ability. Mm -hmm. But if everybody had it, you know, it would not be the society that we can work in. Mm -hmm. And so I had to make it prohibited. Right. I'm working on the second novel. I'm working on the next novel, which will tell you why psionics is banned. Well, and, sure. I mean, well, like you said, uh, tinkering in people's brains are like your, your thoughts aren't your private area, you know, um, it's yeah. uh, and yet and, and some people say, oh, it's, you know, woo woo magic and it's science fantasy or whatever. But to me, it's kind of a staple. I mean, staple of science fiction. I mean, uh, you have psionics and Dune and you have mind melding in Star Trek and in Katras and you have uh, the force in Star Wars and you have uh, the Psychor in uh, Babylon 5 and you have Agent Anderson in uh, Judge Dredd. I mean, it's just like uh, psionics is a staple of uh science fiction and you can think of it as woo woo and it's a staple and we have to make sure that it is controlled and suppressed because if it isn't it takes over and it is not a society that we can understand can you discuss any uh plans for traveler legacy after you eventually retire like uh hopefully uh you'll avoid any um transporter accidents but <laughs> how is the game uh, will be preserved for future generations to enjoy uh, i am actively working on just that what I call a, a succession plan. Uh, and I'm, 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 Traveler needs to continue beyond me. And uh, I'm working to make sure that that happens. Are any of your kids interested in uh, taking on that yoke or? Uh, no. No. Um, they have other interests. Yes. You never. <laughs> All right. Yeah. You can't always count on the kids to join the family business. <laughs> no, and I can't. And so um, I can, I, I don't have plans to announce, but I can tell mm -hmm. you that there are plans okay. being negotiated. Be... What, what happened? Yep. Uh, Are you still there? Yeah, I'm still there. I just, my, my speakers, my, my, okay. Can you hear Okay. Me? Yes. Okay. Yes. Everything's still fine. Okay. Oh, okay. Well, that was actually the uh, end of our uh, interview. That was the last question. <laughs> Did I miss anything? <laughs> you know, this is the best hobby in the world. And the, the, Traveler is the best subset of the best hobby in the world. But role-playing, gaming, the broad spectrum of, you know, it's a good clean-cut hobby that none of us are ashamed to tell other people they think we're geeks or whatever but that's okay that's becoming mainstream these days and i am just blessed to have been in this hobby and been able to spend my life in this hobby on behalf of uh, all the traveler players around the world i want to thank you for creating traveler and um uh giving us um uh you know great times around the table with friends and family and uh, just bringing uh so much um imagination into the world through your through your products so thank you so much i'm flattered to hear that from you frank Thank you. Thank you. All right, folks. Well, uh, that's the end of our interview. Um, I'm your host, Frank Sicardi, also known as Cyborg Prime. And I've had the honor of speaking with Mark Miller, one of the creators of Traveler RPG and the mastermind behind Traveler 5th Edition. Uh, Mark, thank you so much for participating in our milestone 5th Annual Traveler May Day, May Day event and for joining us as the keynote speaker for the third time. <laughs> I appreciate your continued support. You were there for the first and you're here for this one too, our 5th edition to May Day. So thank you so much. Great. Thank you. And to you, dear listener, thank you for being part of this special fifth annual Traveler May Day May Day event. Your support and enthusiasm make this celebration possible. That's all for now, travelers. Until next time, happy traveling.